and um, so uh, it might be of interest to know for people that 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 system that was here in Queensland actually became the basis for the um, apartheid system in South Africa. Uh, delegations of South African, um, what would you say, they're not just politicians, but um, bureaucrats, I suppose, they checked out this legislation and found it it's a perfect, um, a perfect system for what they needed or wanted over there to control their um, indigenous people, the natives. Um, and they put it up and called it um, apartheid, you know. So it's not a very good history, but you can actually, it's a real thing and it's, you can read about it. Um, in one um, historian, a white historian from UQ, University of Queensland called Raymond Evans. Um, you can find that his book and I can't remember the name of it, but it's all about the history of apartheid really. Um, so um, I'm, um, I've been living here all my life, um, have lots of relatives on both sides, uh, from both sides, uh, mother and father, and mainly around Southeast Queensland. Um, Aboriginal, working a lot in Aboriginal affairs, of course, in organisations, and ended up working in the University of Queensland with my very good friend, um, Lilla Watson, Dr. Lilla Watson too. Um, and I'm still working, even though retired, um, still working in that area. Been working for a couple of years now, eh, Mrs. Michelle, I think, on different, different aspects of um, environment and culture, especially environment and culture together, uh, and with other perspectives uh, that, that uh, lean into that too. Yeah. So I guess yeah. I'll leave it there, eh? Well, that's wonderful, Mary. Thanks for, for that beautiful introduction. And I apologize, everyone, for my technical hiccup. Um, but it's really lovely to have you join us. As I mentioned, we have about 110 people registered to join us, uh, but many folks can't do it live anymore. So we're recording the session. So just wanted to let you know that recording mm. button is on. Um, but firstly, hello. And my name is Michelle Maloney. Um, I'm one of the uh, co-founders of the New Economy Network Australia, and I'm also delighted to be a co-director with Mary Graham of uh, Future Dreaming. And with my other hat, I also look after the Australian Earth Laws Alliance. And today, um, I'm really excited to have bring Mary into the discussions we've been having all week about localization. Um, mm. I'm going to share some slides in a moment and tell you the story of what localization, um, the concept is about and why this big international movement is looking at localization. Um, and it occurred to me and all of the work that Mary Graham does on talking about what I think is the remarkable governance system of the First Peoples of Australia, so much that we can learn from um, a really effective way to look after each other and to look after country. Um, it was a perfect opportunity to yet again bring drag Mary into another talk, We're bringing her into a lot of talks because her um, information and message is important. So I'll share screen in a moment. Um, and what we're going to do is I'll do a short overview of some material to get us all thinking about the governance structures that can and cannot support the ideas around localization. And then I'll hand back to Mary to talk about um, what, as I said, this remarkable civilizational culture that looked after this entire continent um, for generations, thousands of generations. And then we'll come back and reflect on what might Australia look like and how could localization as some, in some form be better supported if we learnt um, from one of the oldest continuous successful uh, governance and cultural systems on the planet. So I hope that all sounds okay. Um, so Mary, I'll share screen now. I'll pop you on mm. mute and you just sit back and relax and um, I'll bring your slides up uh, mm -hmm. after I do my little intro. Thank you, love. All right. So this is the event we're here to talk about today. How do we build governance systems to support localization? And as I said, um, we're going to look at the Indigenous relationist ethos and then discuss how that might inform um, both a critique of current governance systems, but also um, how we might be informed by Indigenous ways of thinking and learning. And uh, my computer is now not working at all, which is fabulous. Okay, I'm gonna to have to keep those slides to the left. I'm sorry, the buttons just aren't working. I would personally like to acknowledge country 
Um, and it's become quite the Zoom tradition. If you haven't already done so, please feel free to write in the Zoom um, whose country you live on uh, and which beautiful part of Australia or the rest of the world you're coming from today. But I would like to acknowledge that I now live, work and play on the beautiful lands of the Gubbi Gubbi and Jinnaburra peoples. I'd like to acknowledge el uh, the elders past and present and the emerging uh, custodians and generations of people who are going to continue their remarkable way of caring for country and caring for each other. I'd like to acknowledge that land was never ceded uh, despite the British Empire claiming this continent. Uh, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And I normally like to recognize that in the work I do personally and inside the new economy network and in future dreaming as a descendant of the uh, non-Indigenous people on this continent, I'm a descendant of Irish convicts who were brought here rather unwillingly, um, but I'm honestly so delighted that I am an Australian person. But I'd like to acknowledge in a serious way that we in our organizations and in personal work are really committed to thinking about and engaging with what decolonizing our minds and hearts and activities on this place look like for non-Indigenous people. So that's a personal commitment that I have that informs the work that I do. So in our lovely discussion today, I'm going to, if, if all goes well and I don't drop out completely, uh, give a short introduction to governance. I actually just want to set the scene. We all know what governance is, but we might all have slightly different views on what it is. So I have a small discussion about that. Um, and a little bit of a reflection on what some of the big picture governance structures look like in um, contemporary Australia today. And then we'll go back to Mary and she'll talk about the relationist ethos and Aboriginal law and governance. And then we'll have a discussion together and then with, <clears throat> excuse me, with you, our lovely uh, attendees and participants about what Australian society might look like if we built it on the relationist ethos, which aspects of our lives might look different which might be the same. Um, there's um, some rich and wonderful conversations to be had. So if all goes well, yes, I'm, I'm still here. Awesome. So I do really want to acknowledge the tremendous work by um, the organization called Local Futures, the Economics of Happiness, led by Helena Norberg-Hodge uh, and her wonderful crew of humans. They have been talking about and promoting and working for um, a localization movement across the globe. So what's that all about? Well, uh, the definition on their website is really lovely. Uh, localization is bringing the economy home and, and broader governance to back to a human scale. It's the process of building economic structures that allow the goods and services a community needs to be produced locally and regionally whenever possible. Localizing economies can strengthen community cohesion and lead to greater human health and material well-being while reducing pollution and the degradation of the natural world. I'll just skip down to the bottom there. Um, in their view, uh, localization can involve from community gardens to credit unions, from alternative learning spaces to small business alliances and co-ops. Uh, local economies create networks of place-based relationships that affirm our human desire for connection to each other and to the earth. Now, I think this localization concept is lovely, but for other cultures around the world, non-Western cultures, they might even be pondering why on earth we would have to focus on this when this is the way that most people have lived prior to industrialized society and many continuing cultures today focus on that human scale, that place-based way of being. But as we know, uh, industrialized societies um, have changed the scale of the so-called economy and have changed the level of control we have over the day-to-day -day things we uh, purchase or buy or make or do. And that's why localization is interesting to us inside the new Economy Network Australia. So now I wanna ponder what is governance? Um, and I'd love a little bit of interaction. I know um, we're a large group, but if you'd like to write in the chat um, in a minute, you don't have to write it now, but let's just ponder for a moment, what is governance? And isn't that a beautiful photo of a beautiful wallaby? Oh, okay. Inside Ayla and Future Dreaming, we use the most um, straightforward definition of governance that you, can, that you can dream up. Governance essentially are the rules that we make as human beings to live, work and play together. It could be at any scale um, in any organization. There are governance systems inside a tuck shop, inside your family, inside major corporations, 
And to me, this is why I find governance so fascinating. It is a concept, an idea that you can actually look at the rest of the human world consistently analyzing how people work together, how they structure themselves, how they have their rules. But underneath that simple definition is a complex web for any different cultural society. The rules that we make to live, work and play together are created and understood and transmitted and perhaps enforced in very, very different ways. And in a moment, when I give a quick critique of the Australian governance system and why our modern Australian nation state is part of the dominant way of thinking about governance, we're often blinkered and we think there's only one way to do stuff. We think that formal law and regulations um, are the only way to create law or governance. Um, but as this little image reflects, underneath the rules that any society makes, are some very deeply held cultures, uh, values and beliefs which form our culture and enable us or inspire us to make the rules we want to make to make a society that we would like to see. So this is where we get into the interactive bit and it might seem frivolous at first, but have a think about this. This is my pizza dilemma exercise that helps everyone reflect on the values that they hold underneath any rules or allocation or distribution system they might think is important. So let's imagine for a moment it's Friday night with your family or in your workplace or with any group of people that you might hang out with. And it might not be pizza. It might be a curry. It might be a beautiful stir fry meal. But let's imagine there's pretty much only a couple of bites left. Who gets that last piece of pizza amongst your friends or amongst your family? Who gets the last bit of food in any given gathering? Can you jot into the chat box if you've got any immediate thoughts or responses? And this is a really nice way to get people thinking about, uh, so someone's written the children, thank you. The purpose, uh, the person with the biggest appetite, I like that. Oh, my dogs. My upa, my grandfather, the youngest person. Someone else is saying best to leave it uneaten. So why does it even matter? Oh, then so Holly's put, everyone pretends they don't want it and so nobody has it. <laughs> That's very, very common, isn't it? The most hungry, pop it in the freezer. Now, while people keep putting their suggestions in my son, the people who are physically, you know, there's a lot of values underneath this. So Helen says she would give it to her son. Now that is a mother's value about supporting her children beyond herself. Someone else might write my father because that dad always gets most food or the, the last food in our family. That could be reflecting a patriarchal family. Someone else once told me they lived in a single mother household and it always went to their mum because they all wanted to look after their mum because she looked after them. Now, someone else is putting the compost. That is an earth-centered distribution system. Someone was saying the oldest. I haven't actually heard that one before. The oldest person in the family. I like that. The elders, yep. Toss a coin. So you're putting it out to luck. I like that one too. Others are saying to the hungriest or the largest or the biggest. Now this, I could argue, is a socialist mode of allocating the food to those who need it the most by those who already have had enough. Now, it could get a bit silly here, but if you think about it, how we allocate the simplest of things, that last bite of food in a family or amongst a group of friends can really reflect some important values. I once had this discussion, I, I used it as an example with lots of different groups. And I once had this discussion with a group of school children. And um, one of the boys said, the person who bought it, the person who bought it should get that last bit. And I said, why? He said, because they own it. I said, ah, this is a truly capitalist mode of governing and distributing resources. Now, there's Karen saying, chop it up small so everyone can share. Again, that's a beautiful, socially just, possibly socialist, possibly not. Maybe that's the relationist ethos. Let's explore. But other people have said, save it for tomorrow. That's a conservation ethic. But as you see, how we divvy up the simplest of things is an absolute representation of the values underlying our governance systems. Now, let's bring that back to localization. Recently, and I think it was only a couple of weeks ago, Nina was delighted to host Matt Grudnoff from the Australia Institute uh, to do what is now an annual tradition of a budget rundown. The Australian federal budget is one of the biggest 
allocations of collective resources in Australia. I think it's $600 billion. And how that budget is divvied up really reflects the values possibly of our society, but definitely of the ruling elite or the ruling decision makers. And if you break down that budget, you can see what the nation states key decision makers think is important. And interestingly, there was almost no budget for anything to do with climate change. There was no direct allocation to housing or providing housing. They spent $10 billion, I think, or $1 million into a housing fund so that the market could generate enough money for housing. Now, in the past, governments simply paid uh, into a fund to make housing more accessible for people. Here we are in the middle of a housing crisis in Australia, and they're putting money into um, the stock market so they can make enough money to then get the market to determine how to allocate and create new housing. This reflects what's important to different governments. And of course, let's not speak of the multi-million dollar uh, decision to create submarines for our future. The bottom line is, anytime you get confused about governance, think about the pizza and think about the rules you might have in any given society or space or time to allocate resources. So now with technology loves me, I'm gonna to try to go to my next slide. Oh my goodness me, yay. So very quickly, before we go back to Mary, I wanted to give you a literally a speedy overview of let's think about the governance system in the continent now known as Australia. And then we can reflect later on if we're interested in localization, if we think enabling people at the community and the human scale to make greater decisions about their own life, their own livelihoods, secure housing, a stronger economy, can we do that? Do we have a governance system that supports localization? So this is what people look at when they see modern Australia. And let's reflect for a moment. It's broken up with very straight lines other than a few squiggles. Uh, it's created political boundaries um, and it's governed by three tiers of government, federal government, state governments and local councils. And they all have their own um, aspects of power. And we can talk about the history of that another time. But one thing that the entire modern Australia shares is a colonial history and the culture and the governance decisions that we make today are actually still deeply infused with the colonial history that brought modern Australia into being. So firstly, what is colonization? Well, when it takes place under the protection of broad colonial structures like governments and nation states, it may be termed settler colonialism. And this often involves settlers dispossessing indigenous inhabitants or instituting legal and other structures which systematically disadvantage whoever was there before, because it refers to the large scale population movements where migrants maintain strong links with their or their ancestors former country. Now, why do I mention colonization? It's because as we know um, from the 1600s or the late 1500s onwards, a small group of people relatively to the entire world population left their homes in Europe um, in search of new trade routes and new ways to support their own governance systems, their own ideas about what an economy is by stealing land, taking people, creating certain structures that were beneficial, but certain structures that were not beneficial to other people. And when you think about that core place of people and those core set of ideas that were then infused into cultures and countries all around the world, it's a really important thing to note that those ideas um, came from one part of the world. And in a longer talk, I often get people to imagine the world in 1400. And it was this complex patchwork quilt of biocultural relationships between people and between people in their places. They all had very different cultures, religions, beliefs, and practices, much of which, not all, much of which has been taken over by this globalized Eurocentric way of thinking, doing, and governing. And of course, this is the history of Australia. Australia's governance system today is absolutely a reflection of its historical past. We are a relatively young colonial nation. Um, the British claimed New South Wales in 1788. And you can see very briefly from this map, the different years 
where they carved up a new colony or they broke out another patch of place. Um, and many aspects of our government that we often don't think about today, the broad governance of our collective resources um, are hierarchical, that's accepted. Some people are rich, some people are poor. For many people that's accepted. We absolutely have a top-down um, power-based system um, where yes, we have democracy, Representative democracy is a limited structure compared to other modes, but it does give local people the ability to vote for folks. But often we see this power perpetuated in those individuals or corporate lobbyists and others who can influence how decisions, laws get made. We have a state supported by the military and the police. In many ways, we still have a patriarchal culture, not completely, and absolutely not at the grassroots level. Most families don't live that way, but there is this undercurrent of male domination of many positions of so-called power. And I won't go through all of these points, but as someone who works on environmental issues, it's really important to note that the crown, the government, medieval concept, if I ever heard one, um, still controls um, everything under the soil and is effectively seen as the owner of the land and it leases out to other people and, and allows the purchase of some land in different ways. But the cultural superiority defined by the white Australia policy in the 20th century and defined by what Mary has already mentioned, um, this, these concepts of how colonial powers abused, mistreated um, and isolated or tried to uh, indigenous folks in the name of taking over the country all of these ideas are absolutely prevalent today. And as a colonial uh, country, we're still grappling with them. What do these structures mean for strengthening localization, for creating more compassionate rules, for even in my interests area, I'm uh, sorry, area of interest, strengthening an earth-centered ethic and culture? Well, it's not the end of the world. We have seen what our governance system has created and if you look across this high level map, you'll see that all the white spaces are where vegetation has been completely removed in the sake of this new governance systems values for economic development and food production. And it doesn't have to be so destructive. There are other ways to govern. So that's where I wanted to stop and I've probably gone on way too long, but the question I wanna ask and that we'll come back to after Mary's talk is, are we trapped in the structures of our history? Of course, we're not. We can recreate how we live and how we are in our society, but that is enough from me. So I hope that that sets a context firstly for what localization week and what localization as a concept is about. The fact that governance is like the air, it's everywhere all at once. And the fact that here in Australia, if we are passionate or interested in localization, we have some pretty serious barriers with a top-down governance system, particularly where state governments control an awful lot of the decision-making. So now I'd like to put a pin in the thinking of Western culture and Australian culture and governance and hand over to Mary. And Mary, please feel free to talk for 20 or 30 minutes because um, it'll still give us a good half an hour for a yarn with everyone. Um, so thank you so much for your attention, everybody, and for bearing with me. <laughs> And I hope I haven't made everyone want pizza for lunch. Okay, over to you, Mary. You're on mute, love. Can you put um, the language map up again? Yes, I Is will. Is it possible? Just yes. to, I usually start off like this um, because when people uh, look at that map, which is made made by was made by a white man, a white fellow. Um, oh, I always forget his name. Um, Tyndale. 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 He made that map. Uh, I think he got information from a whole lot of people, Aboriginal people, explorers, the state, you know, libraries, whatever he did, you know. Um, and the original map was well, black and white and so on. And over the years, it's, it's been changed and uh, prettified, you know, into that uh, multicolored thing. I'll bring it uh, back. Which is very own. nice. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but w when people look at it, um, you're realizing it's it's amazing, you know, all these different languages and place. But the other uh, important thing is that what you're actually looking at is a governance system, a structure. That's actually what it is. All of these hundreds and hundreds of places, they're all independent, interdependent. They're autonomous. Um, that is, they don't have any uh, state structure 
or a centralized powerful group of, of um, um, countries, uh, any of these areas that dominate their surroundings or dominate the rest of the country or anything like that. So no hierarchy at all. No hierarchy among all these hundreds of places. Every one of them are independent or autonomous, as you could say. So um, it starts off like that, but I, I, uh, it's just to fill you in on exactly what that map is actually saying. Once you once you realise that it's not only language, but it's a system, that also um, hopefully gives you the idea that actually how Aboriginal people um, uh, uh, developed in this country was very very different. So, uh, for example, I'll just start off with about human beings being human. The oldest ones. Uh, Africa, Rift Valley, Kenya, people might be familiar with those places or names. Um, humans, uh, million, million and a half or two million people uh, are years old, uh, gradually becoming more developed, more closer to um, Homo sapiens. All those names that you might be familiar with also from um, uh, documentaries, you know, uh, Neanderthals, Australopithecus, all that kind of thing and then gradually becoming fully homo sapiens, traveling out of Africa, going to the north, around to the other side, going down to through the, um, um, <clears throat> that going back down south via the Americas or another groups uh, via uh, what became Asia into this country. This country still being formed. It's, it's um, uh, what do you call it? It's, um, the shape of it, you know, very quite a few ice ages and so on. Uh, the sea reclining, um, uh, sorry, reclining, re receding, um, and so on. So you end, we end up with this um, shape here. People coming into the country, first first peoples coming in around to the edges, around the edges, gradually filling up, occupying the centre, and so on and so on, um, and. Uh, how Aboriginal people's opinion about this is that um, they kind of disagree or they just think it's an interesting other story um, that no, we didn't come from anywhere else. We only came from this country here. This is the country in their words, which grew us up, which realized you know, who we were that literally invented us, literally created us, invented us and continues to look after us. Um, so the idea of Aboriginal people becoming more developed ends up with an idea of a relationless relationalism. You, relation, you have a relationless connection with the land itself. Now it's not, it's not, um, oh, how do you put it? It's not worshiping nature. They're not nature worshipers um, uh, and they don't bow down to it or anything. So it's, it's not a structural, you know, hierarchical kind of thing where um, a, a one God figure is running everything. No, it's, it's its own, it owns itself basically. And our coming into it is that we realize in our gradual long development, um, we become um, reflectively human over time. And when we become reflectively human, where we realize that is that because they realize it in a particular place. So the idea is that that land there where we've realized it, ah, that's the, that's what's invented us. That's, that's why there's such a close relationship with land. Um, that's why there's nothing like uh, in the old system, Aboriginal system, there are thousands of Christians now, uh, but in the old system, um, your uh, ancestral um, ancestral uh, spirits are coming out of that land into you and has invented you, has created you, but also has looked after you, continues to look after us uh, in all kinds of ways um, and, and so on. So um, the idea of some figure that you can't see having invented us, that's somehow that's the creator, but it isn't. The creator is actually the land itself, but you don't worship it. You you take your um, uh, idea from it in the sense of looking after it. So it goes like this, there's a great reciprocal relationship, great. Um, it invents us, it looks after us, gives us, you know, obviously everything, food, 
food, water, resources, materials, and so on and so on. It continues to look after us because if it wasn't there, as we know, we'd be floating in space or we'd die of lack of oxygen and so on and so on. We just simply wouldn't exist. So it is looking after us. We are obliged forever to look after it. So it's a it's a related relational problem, uh, relational uh, structure, not hierarchical. The social and political structure is um, is flat. So completely different governance also from from that idea. So no no structure like um, uh, pharaohs, emperors, royalty. Uh, no religious group. No military group like the Spartans, you know, at the top, and everybody has to do what they're told. No class system, uh, no caste system, uh, nothing like that at all. Um, so the only distinct big distinctions are we all, via mother and father, come from a particular place that is their country, um, plus the distinction between ages, ages and wisdom and that sort of thing, and male and female too. Um, and it is just male and female. Um, but humans themselves, individuals, are autonomous beings too. They're autonomous. They're their own boss. Autonomy in this regard is seen as not a you become a law unto yourself. It's autonomy with a view to um, seeking relations, seeking relationality, that is. Uh, now, it's not to do with um, we'll all get together and join hands and sing Kumbaya. It's not to do with necessarily a moral kind of idea. It's that, that we are not alone in the world. So we're, while we're autonomous, um, you seek relationality, uh, relationalism. Don't think of it as good relations in that sense. Think of it as a very basic biological thing. Um, for example, the tiny baby. The tiny baby... Um, you know, very, um, you know, important, <laughs> extremely important. Uh, what, it, it, you know, the, uh, uh, what's his name? Hierarchy of needs fella, Maslow, right? He'll talk about the uh, purely practical physical things that the, the tiny baby needs. It needs food, water to drink, milk, of course, it needs to be, have comfort. So it's nappy changed and all that kind of stuff. So it needs practical comfort and so on. Um, and, and that's survivalist. That's a survivalist meaning that that's why the baby and everybody can, can survive in that way. But it also needs other things like um, um, tenderness, um, um, what's the word? Uh, cuddles, if you want to say, cuddles and speech. In other words, it needs the relationalist. Those things are relationalist. The baby has to know there are others, there's another there, not just be fed like a pet. Do you know what I mean? Um, there's terrible stories of um, from other countries where uh, you may have recalled this sometime in the news or oh, many years ago, one particular country. Um, it they went to Romania, Mary, those so, orphans. Yeah, those yeah, orphans, neglected. hundreds of them. And were neglected. I hate to think they're deliberately neglected, but there wasn't enough people around, nurses, you know, carers, to look after all of them. They could just bear the bare bones of looking after them, like feeding and milk and all that. And then, but no cuddles, no cuddles and no speech. And those babies, they didn't, they didn't last. They didn't survive actually. Um, the equivalent, uh, no, I, I was going to say is it can, it's not an equivalent, but something modern and happens quite often, unfortunately, is new young mothers who have um, uh, what do they call it? Problems of uh, postnatal problems. Depression. Yeah. Pro yeah, depression. Yeah. They cannot bear to touch the baby. You got the, the 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 mother, new young mother needs help. You know what I mean to look after the baby properly, and that's the equivalent. And they've discovered that young babies, if they don't get that kind of um, care, re relational and speech and all of that, and they don't know anything about the mother, they end up with a very damaged uh, psyche, a very damaged. Um, uh, what do they call it? Um, they have no sense of what's good and right and all that. They end up with um, a pathology, a particular kind of pathology. It's been proved, you know. So anyway, so in the uh, developmental kind of growth over thousands of years, Aboriginal people understood a great deal about what kind of governance system you have to have. 
in the end, without going through too much of it, you have to have a, a, a law of obligation of looking after people. Everybody has to be looked after in some way. Empathy, um, ethics, you can't leave people behind. You can't pe leave people out of out of uh, being looked after. All of everybody, you have to have a system like that. And if you don't have a system like that, that's what some cultures, other cultures call a lack of human rights, actually. That's human rights abuse. If you don't look after everybody. Unfortunately, you know, um, what is a, a democratic capitalist country? You, you can end up in very rich, powerful countries with um, millions of people living on the street. You know what I mean? Bad health, all that sort of stuff. You, you end up basically with human rights abuse in a rich, a rich democratic country, supposedly, you know. So they, they now they couldn't foresee the future, Aboriginal people, but they knew that that's what you, that's what a proper governance system needs, politically and socially and all that. So and you get the lesson from it of looking after land. So land is, in a sense, looking after the land is a great trainer, for real, in how to look after how to look after humans, the whole of society. So you got they go together. You know, um, so a, a law of obligation, custodial ethos, uh, a one liner that I, I think sort of uh, doesn't explain it all, but it's something like um, a sacralized ecological, um, uh, eco ecological um, relationalist, uh, sorry, collaborative, collaborative stewardship system. That's the kind of um, that's the kind of civilization that we had. You know, no hierarchy at all, but like that, ecological connection with ecological, um, um, relational. Um, you know that everybody is included, so it's collaborative, and it's a stewardship system. So stewardship, you know, not um, not not anything else. But Aboriginal people themselves, most of them, are not very good Democrats. They don't like. They like the idea of looking after you. See. You know what I mean? Nobody must be left behind. Anyway, so reflectivity um, and um, having a, um, uh, they're, they're two different things. Um, um, sorry, survivalism and um, relationalism. They're, they're things that are done, but there is a ref relationalist ethos. That's Law of obligation is a relationalist ethos, a philosophy of being like that. And a survivalist ethos is where if you've been either personally, you know, you have to look out for yourself all the time. Don't get run over by a bus as you go walking in the streets. Um, you might get sacked too, along with a hundred others, just so a, a corporate <laughs> corporates uh, can pay their um, CEOs a lot more. Um, or you can be uh, running away from a war or some kind of big, big crisis. That's a large scale survivalist, um, uh, survivalist um, situation. But sometimes some people end up with a very hard line view about existence and um, the, the life uh, world a anyway. So old, old ideas, when they get hardened in their thinking like this, they'll say uh, have sayings like um, the world is uh, the world is um, you know uh, full of um, uh, the, sorry um, it's a dog eat dog world you've all heard these sort of sayings a dog eat dog world look after number one don't trust anybody don't only look after you and yours first first everybody else comes second um they're hard line thinking people who think that think of themselves as battlers um I, I wouldn't say they're hard line kind of thing but they've learned things through struggle and and so on and but they might everything uh, might be okay after a while most people cope with that kind of thing even people who've been through terrible things like wars and and that you know anyway um so a different governance system altogether. And by the way, it's not uh, tribalism. I always had problems with the word tribal myself, but tribal is um, where you have different groups, tribes, if you like, um, who fight with each other over having a, um, a, a good outcome to um, uh, take care of um, that particular part of land, even take over somebody else's land. 
uh, this old system, Aboriginal, had no um, uh, wars of conquest. No war, you just think about that, for tens of thousands of years, they didn't go around attacking other people's land to take land away from them. That's why they, it's been proved Aboriginal people have been in their places for literally tens, for literally tens of thousands of years. They didn't bother taking over other people's land like practically everywhere else in the world. And that's been amazing for political scientists and uh, anthropologists and so on and so on. It's not to say there wasn't conflict, there was conflict, uh, but it didn't go further into extreme conflict like wars of conquest, taking over other people's places, you know. Um, anyway, I'll go on to, very quickly to logic. We have our own logic, very different from Western logic. Aristotle, Aristotle you, you all heard of Aristotle. He's the man who wrote the book uh, about logic, actually. Um, so they have a particular kind of logic and it's been called like a logic of the arena, very clear rules, either or, either you're a friend of America or you're an enemy, you can't sit on the fence anymore. That's the logic of the globe actually at the moment. Other things like all red haired people are mad. I know Miss Jones, she's got red hair, she must be mad, you know? So anything that begins with that, the law of identification, the law of contradiction or non-contradiction, those three rules very much um uh very much um Arist aristotle they are still in place in place in places like um law western law you know when you watch a like me if you're like me uh, watching a uh cop shows you know <laughs> um in the in the court uh say they're in the court you're a witness uh, there's a witness and he or she is asked um were you or were you not in such and such a place, such and such a time. And they are directed, the witness is directed to say, now don't elaborate, just say yes or no. That's pure Aristotelian logic, pure. And you have to do that, as you know, um, Michelle, not just in the shows <laughs> on TV, but in real fact, you know. Um, Absolutely, so, Mary. And I wrote, yeah. I actually wrote in the chat, the Western legal mm. system is definitely embedded in the law of the arena. You've only got yes. to look at how lit litigation works and how cases are yeah. brought. And people think nothing of that, but there are other things that don't have that. Yeah. They have a different no. way. Yeah. That's that's right. Everybody thinks, oh, well, that's the way it is. How can you fight against it? You know, and so on. Um, but it, that's right. Uh, Karen saying capitalism is definitely a survivalist system, you know. And, you know, some of the brilliant people in the world of all co different cultures, uh, economists I'm talking about and polit polit um, gov um, people in governance and politics, political science people, historians, they have written books about how to civilise capitalism. How do you make it more moral and so, not so cruel to people? Do you know what I mean? They've written all these books, but um, nothing much ever changes, you know. Uh, but anyway, that sort of logic, Aboriginal logic, I'll just jump straight to that, is that map before. So it goes like this, hundreds of places, hundreds of dreaming stories. Every place has a dreaming story. Uh, a dreaming story is a law for that place. There are hundreds of laws. They overlap. Uh, a law for a place is the truth that emerges or arise, arises from a place, a locality. A locality has its own truth. And the truth is basically um, a, uh, oh God, what's that word? A perspective. So it's hundreds of all these things, hundreds of laws, truths, um, um, dreamings, hundreds of perspectives. And the equivalent, the logic equivalent is um, your, um, um all all perspectives across this whole big country that's bigger than europe the whole of europe could fit comfortably in here um the the um all the um perspectives are valid and reasonable not right necessarily but it might be right for that group but taken as a whole um they're valid and reasonable so the the real thing of it the real meaning of it it's very useful that is, um, it suspends judgmentalism. So if you have a meaning of life like the law of obligation, reciprocal, look after people and so on, it's a good idea to have a logic that isn't judgmental, you know. Um, so the last thing, um, and there's more to it than that, but uh, the last thing is um, 
um, large agriculture, large scale agriculture. Our poor old country didn't have great big mother rivers like a whole lot of other continents did. If you have a large scale agriculture, uh, b sorry, big mother rivers, um, when they flood, they come down and they bring enormous amounts of silt. If you are lucky to have that, you can have large scale agriculture. None of that happened here. So we had small scale agriculture, those brilliant books by Bruce Pascoe, Bill Gamage, you know, the greatest estate on earth and so on. Um, they describe exactly how Aboriginal people ran the country. They, and they did, don't, don't think of it as their tribal groups wandering about, fighting with each other and looking for food and so on. This is a, an actual system. That's why it's a civilization, but it's a civilizational culture, not a civilizational state. There's no state at all because it's a self-regulating society too. That's why you're autonomous. We are all supposed to be autonomous in our own locality and living in our own locality and not trying to boss everybody else around like the neighbor or anything. Um, so, um, the, uh, so, they, um, so great big, um, 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 what do you call it, agriculture, comes to comes to the fore, gets bigger, powerful, more rich, more wealthy, and so on. Um, uh, the, it changes their governance system. They might have had a loose kind of hierarchy before, but after big agriculture becomes really wealthy, you know, and becomes a strict hierarchy like that, then they become rigid. It's a rigid hierarchy, and of course. What happens is com competitiveness, full-scale competitiveness. People are trying to work out in the ancient world who is going to be the hegemonic ruler of a particular area. And the awful thing about it, though, is it hasn't stopped. Right now, from that time then, uh, 10, 12,000 years ago, when big agriculture first happened, um, it, it, is, it, it changed, you know, lots of wars, uh, lots, huge amounts of change, technology for sure, technology uh, in all sorts, domestic technology, of course, uh, farming to agriculture itself, buildings, all sorts of things. But the big main important one was weapons technology. More and more over the thousands of years, you know, you've heard of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? The Iron Age, the something or other age, some other age, gets better and better at having wars to compete over who runs the place yeah. and right now it's the whole globe that's why that that logic is dangerous you know um um either or you know um the logic is uh the hierarchical i know uh, hierarchy the hegemonic controller hegemonic controller has to run the whole world uh own all the resources because that's what the wars are about they're, they're not really in the end, not really about uh, resources. You could say that, or religion. It was about religion at one stage, but it goes through all these things. But the the basic um, fought over thing is always been who controls resources, and that's exactly what all these wars are about today. You can disagree. I mean, by all means, you know. But it's been pretty well proved that that's what it's that's what it's about. The other thing that's needed with agriculture, though, too big to starting off, is um, Oh, sorry, I've missed some part. Um, big agriculture, because uh, that was the last standing uh, racial insult against Aboriginal people. We're so apparently so ignorant and primitive and that we didn't even discover the wheel, you know. <laughs> supposed to be uh, almost like, um, you know, um, so primitive, uh, so primitive might even be the missing link. Um, but so what do you need with big agriculture? You need vehicles with wheels that's where wheels come in they didn't even think that there are other cultures that also didn't discover wheels uh, invent wheels either um but they have these big um wheel uh, wheeled vehicles <laughs> bring all the crops or whatever else back to a central place where they're all set, sorted counted and recorded and then you have what do you have you have uh, writing and as everybody knows writing starts in those ancient places like the Middle East, especially, you know, Samaria, you know, and um, because the, the first writing was recording um, amounts, do you know what I mean? Counting, counting stuff, you know. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Middle East, uh, China and India. The Europeans invented printing, but not writing. 
No. Um, so, uh, but the other important factor that was missing is this poor old country, <laughs> you know, dry as anything. Um, it didn't have any um, domesticatable animals, nothing at all. No um, horses, no horses. They come from another place, another continent, I think. Um, no cattle. And that's also why for tens of thousands of years, we never had access to milk, like cow's milk, I mean. The only milk you had was mother's milk. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you grew out of that, that's it, you know, that was it. Uh, that's also why a lot of Aboriginal people uh, still, I think today, can't, uh, can't, um, mob uh, no, what do you call it? Metabolise yeah. Yeah, metabolize milk. Mm. You know, they have lactose Lots of problems. people can't. Yeah, lots, lots, lots of people. Of people. Yeah, yeah, no, lots of people. That's right. Um, also, by the way, they can't metabolise alcohol you know, Aboriginal people. That's why they, you know, they can't take it very well. Uh, but this is the same for many Indigenous people, like Indians, American Indians. We, we share these things with them, our lot, our health lot shares these problems with their health lot. And, so and, on, and again, so Mary, it's because everybody, you know, emerged mm. in their own pocket of the world. And then when that's right, yeah. the Eurocentric way came, then yes. all these things were introduced and suddenly there's something wrong with you because yes. you have this or you can't process yeah. that in your own... But it's yes. just, yeah, it's, it's not, just, no. just colonization. That's it's just colonization, and really. Not, and that's not true. That's right. Yeah. They, they really it's, shouldn't. They it's shouldn't like that with writing, alcohol. Mary. Everyone says that Aboriginal yeah. people didn't have writing, but they did yep. have um, yeah. not so much hieroglyphics, but they've proven with all of the mm. different um, paintings and oh, symbols. Yes, yes. They had a symbolic way of communicating about that's lots right. of complex things, but they didn't have yeah. what Europeans recognised as writing. So that, That's right. It's been proved. Well, yeah. it's, um, I, I've heard those arguments from uh, um, uh, artistic people. Art, art itself is a is a language of its own for everybody around the world, you know, for all cultures and so on. But yes, alcohol, you know, that's why. Uh, and of course, Europeans and other cultures, they've had alcohol for thousands of years, so it just works like that, you know. Um, so it's a um, a whole. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, get back to um, animals. <laughs> uh, we didn't also have uh, buffalo, like the Asian buffalo was used for agriculture in Asia. Um, no elephants, of course, no elephants, no camels, no what they call transhumance animals, that is herding animals. You know, the great Sami, the, the, uh, up in the cold, white, white Aboriginals, they, they insist on calling themselves. <laughs> they've been there forever and they've herded um, deer for thousands of years, thousands of deer for thousands of years. Uh, so no deer, only now we've got some deer have been brought in, you know. Uh, so um, no deer, no sheep, no goats, um, no pigs, <laughs> um, no llamas or alpacas like uh, the indigenous people in Latin America have. They used to herd them too. So nothing to herd. So you couldn't even half start to build, you know, what, what other cultures had from that. You know, the only one was the old, um, and, and not even, you couldn't, possibly heard them um, and they weren't here all that long about 10,000 years uh, apparently what I've been told I don't know how long really but dingoes you know yeah. but dingoes are a different kind of mob dingoes mobs are they're um they're very independent mm -hmm. in a way they're um autonomous beings too they don't like being um they're not they're, they're not cut out to be pets you can't, <laughs> they'd be highly insulted if you want to treat them like pets they're like, like a the partner and Mary, you always bring this up about the lack of transhumans animals. But when you think about it, Australia, I mean, the peoples of Australia uh, emerged yeah. with and learnt from all the creatures that were here. Yeah, and this was a bioregional yeah. response that, of course, you can't herd kangaroos. I mean, can no. you imagine trying to capture imagine. anything that hopped like that? Um, yes, and yet yes. The European mindset was thou shalt domesticate this way. Whereas yes, yes. We already know from everyone's work from Bruce Pascoe, Bill Gammon. Yes. Yes, and all of the way. systems were in place for for harnessing nature in a in a oh, stable God, yes. way. Fish yes, traps, you know, fish traps, catching animals effectively. Yes, yeah. There was a wonderful story, um, a real, uh, you know, uh, put in uh, um, archives. Um, it's this black fellow somewhere down south, I think it was. Um, he, a white fellow, came upon him. He was out walking and came across upon this black fellow who'd worked out a very very clever little gadget 
fishing on the bank, you know, a, a stick stuck, a, a firm sticks uh, in the um, sand, um, attached to uh, a line, and at the line, um, uh, a, not a line, a uh, a bendy kind of branch with no no leaves, you know, bendy sort of branch. It could whip, you know, like a whip. And at the end of that, then there's a fishing line. Well, he could just sit there. Um, the fish would be caught, trapped, you know, the bait, take the bait. And somehow that would trigger um, this bendy kind of part to take that fish, get that fish, chuck it. It, it would release uh, it because it was taut, you know, tense. It could release it. And that fish would come back on the bank, on the bank, right next to the fisherman, of course. And I thought a very, you know, clever little way of <laughs> catching fish without moving. Even <laughs> all you'd have to do is rebait and sit and wait and flick it. <laughs> yeah, flick it. Yeah, it'd be flicked down right there. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this this white fella found this, and um, he very impressed. He said, "Yeah, I was very very impressed this little gadget," um, but he couldn't help it. You know, he couldn't help but say because he didn't want to say anything really good about the blackfellas. He said, well, this, yes, this gadget, um, very clever though it is, it suits the lazy blackfella who doesn't want to work. You know, blackfellas are lazy and they don't want to, ex you know, expend their energy too much, you know, so they take the lazy way out of them. And again, these things. cultural I thought, Jesus, oh, Mary, you cannot Mary. win, you know. <laughs> As a non-Indigenous person, I woke up, I woke up, I grew up listening to these bizarre concepts yes. that um non-indigenous people had mm. of other folk from anywhere who didn't do a nine to five day you know yes, of, yes. of cultures that had worked out how to make enough food and then yes. have an incredibly rich spiritual life were seen as lazy mm. whereas mm. today industrial society people are exhausted and burned out looking yeah. for downshifting degrowth and trying to find mm. their way back to a lifestyle yes. that's more compassionate and kind all of that so it's yeah. bizarre isn't it it's bizarre it's, it's bizarre and the, the, even the, some economists you'll hear them say things like that about how to do that how to civilize uh, economies anyway yep. let that's alone, what we're all about and that's even what let me, alone yeah. capitalism yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway now, that's I, it yeah no i was just going to say um thank you for that beautiful overview of some of the aspects of the governance system the relationist ethos i love the law of obligation and as someone who um you know has a legal background a, a governance system that wasn't built on adversarial rights but no, of people understanding adversarial. did you want to talk just a little bit more about what the law of obligation meant for people in place because one thing we didn't mention today mm. mary is western science has now caught up with what aboriginal people already knew which is far from being you know and again i i Sorry about the facial expressions, but when I think about the things I was told as I grew up in this country as a non-Indigenous person, that Aboriginal people were nomads and wandered around aimlessly. Mm, aim like, like, oh, but the, mm. you know, you guys are some of the most located people. Did you want to talk for mm. just a minute about, you know, Western science has proven that some people have been in the same bio region for fifty thousand years, not just the continent. Oh yeah, yes. And that they cart similarity. You know that quote you yes about location. Yep. Yes, no, it's um, it has been literally proved scientifically, um, through hair strands, and they compared these hair strands, which were found and lost in the Adelaide Museum, mind you, lost thank in a way it was thank heavens that it was lost because it protected it, um, and they were they tested, compared and tested it with the local Aboriginal people around the Adelaide area. They're the same people, the same people, and they. Uh, worked out the age was about was around about between fifty to sixty thousand years, so a group of people have been in one area, and um, by uh, inference, everybody else is in the same. What's name? They stayed in the place, and that's what they couldn't understand. Um, uh, uh, um, what do you call them? Anthropologists. They couldn't yes. understand why did they stay in the one place. Now mm. the place is a kind of whole region, of course, and. Um, other people are in other regions, neighbouring, but they're not, they're not, they're autonomous, but not autonomous as in having guards, borders with guards on them and things like that. There was completely localised uh, arrangements, diplomatic traditions, uh, and we're actually working at the moment, uh, you know, hey, I told you, um, about um, Aboriginal ideas about foreign policy, about international relations, because people in in some areas of um, 
uh, political science, political philosophy, recognize our old system as an international system, actually. It is actually how to have diplomacy. And, and this is ancient classic diplomacy of how do you, how do you have, because if you're going to have a system, no, uh, no um, wars of conquest, that's what saves you, you know. So you have this relationship with your neighbours and others, and it's not all, you know. Join, let's join hands and sing kumbaya. It's, um, it's part of it is to do with like empathy, but you've built relations over thousands of years, you know, and so on. But you've also built and developed really good ways of um, managing conflict, and and that's a very important part of diplomacy too. Mm. You know, so uh, and locality. The the one thing I do like, uh, I've read a couple of things. I don't know if people know the word sortition. It's Greek sortition, um, but some people are experimenting with it in the forms of citizen assemblies or people's assemblies, smaller. Just imagine, um, a bit like a jury, uh, somebody being brought to jury duty or something. So uh, a select group of people, say about the size of a suburb. Uh, of people, that amount of people, and all they do is uh, they look after their region, you know, not to the exclusion of else other people, because you've already got arrangements, diplomatic arrangements about managing managing resources. So you don't, you, they never started off um, competing. That's the big thing. They never never cross the line in competing over resources. You have to. Um, you, ha you have to work together on managing it because it's good for everybody because it's logical and common sense you know I, I always think you know people tend to think that there's a wisdom about aboriginal uh stuff but actually i always tend to think it's um common sense you know it's a whole culture of common sense <laughs> don't don't have uh, big wars you know you can't uh, get rid of conflict there are stories about conflict. And even in the language, there's lots of stories, uh, sorry, language words for any kind of conflict you can think of, anything. Um, fight, of course, fight, um, tackle, um, um, uh, uh, murder, murder, you know, feud, duel. There's about 20 different words or more probably uh, that means conflict. Eh? Well, there's, those words are in Aboriginal language all the time there. Uh, there's a word for war in Yukon Bear language too, you know, meaning a big battle with deaths and all that. But there's no word in any of these languages. Uh, I say that because I hear other people say that too. Um, and because the things I learned from my own my own family, you know, my old, old people, um, people, uh, there's no word for invasion. It doesn't exist. Invasion is a, a completely utterly different or foreign concept. The the classic invasion, invade, um, invade, what's the word? Conquer, conquest, and sub subjugate. There's no words for those things. Mm. Because the idea was that you just didn't do it. No, you can imagine if you haven't been invaded, either internally or externally, for tens of thousands of years, it, it wouldn't be a concept that you know until two, three hundred years ago. You know, because we did have other other relations, um, Asian groups, different Asian groups over well over a thousand or so, nearly two thousand years, coming and going, getting various things. Occasionally, they'd have a row too. Apparently, you know, oh, they tell you stories about that. Those Aboriginal people. Yes, this is a time when something or other, something or other, they had a fight about something. But then it all goes back to normal, you know, because of that very clever old. Uh, diplomatic systems, you see, yeah. and of course with uh, Torres Strait Islander people, you know. And um, Mary, one one thing that I'm not sure we mentioned today, but when we look at that map of Aboriginal Australia, it's the ultimate example. You call it multipolar, which is very mm. much international relations theories about. And again, as a young right. Indigenous person, yes. when I was in my twenties, starting to work with Indigenous groups, um, yes, I was always they were always talking about protocols, and I had to mm. learn what do they even mean by that protocols. Yes. Are how government agencies can talk to them, yeah, how they, they talk with each, with each other. other. And yeah. they, were rep they were basically rebuilding or replicating what they had mm. in their society, which was this mm. very strong yeah. notion mm. of how to be the proper way with each other. Yeah, um, have proper way. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, and I've I've taken to calling it because I've heard uh, again other people uh, calling it this. Not not the black fellas, the white fellas, calling it classic um, classic 
classical or classic diplomacy oh, ancient right. society the diplomacy of ancient societies yeah. they yeah. all had very particular ways of doing this um, sh sharing gifts when they come and visit and all the kind reciprocity, of reciprocity yeah. reciprocity and all all that sort of thing yeah. and uh, we're writing a paper about that at the moment um but yes um so mary um again thank you so much and there's some beautiful comments coming in really enjoying your talk could we talk for just a moment um because yeah. i did promise in the blurb for this event um mary and i are working on a book what's looking at what australian society could look like if it was built mm. on the relationist ethos at the moment we're calling it future law because as a person with legal background the idea of these very old and ancient legal and governance structures and how successful, as Mary says, in pragmatic terms, the sheer nature of the success of a culture to have um, endured mm. through many changes throughout time. Anyway, mm. perhaps we could just have a chat for a moment, Mary. I'll mm. put this slide up uh, just as a mm. prompt. Um, so if we think as non-Indigenous people, um, we often hear this beautiful term of caring for country, uh, mm. And country, of course, is that conflation of land as a moral entity and caring for each other. So can you and I just have a chat for a moment about what Australian mm. society would look like, which bits we keep, which bits mm. might look different if it was built on the relationist ethos? And I've popped caring for each other first, but that's wrong because caring mm. for country is actually the template that provides mm. how we look after each other. But Mary, yes, can you talk right. about Medicare, perhaps. Uh, I well, know that, you that as a good yeah, example, yeah. That's a very good example. And it's a pity that at this moment, uh, various interested vested interests, including that Tory government over there, um, is trying to get rid of it by deliberately defunding or underfunding it, the National Health Service. That old, um, that old thing, uh, that that system coming in after the Second World War um, of um, that uh, a very good quality health care uh, and free uh coming in and looking after people people who are too poor to even look after themselves properly have good good health care um and uh you didn't have that they didn't have to pay for it it's free a free health care system which is proper that's the proper thing to do it shouldn't be a privilege do you know what i mean where doctors make heaps of money and so on and it's backed by the state one of the few things that are backed by the state try doing doing a, an ethical thing you know so but apparently at the moment everybody complains about it and um when you read the real story about how terrible it's becoming it's because it's being deliberately underfunded mm. so they're trying to wreck it to bring in an american system mm. the american system where you know people in the health make huge amounts of money huge you know and uh so half the half the population or a third of them are in bad health bad health they don't get looked after you know uh, and not because it's apparently it is a, the only country in the world that doesn't have a national health system you know all these other old uh, yes. uh systems like australia too national and health australia, system mary people criticize it but i've i've lived mm. in the uk and the us mm. and uh, the difference is remarkable. Yes. So a, a number of health issues appeared when I was in the UK, walked in, free, free system, got assistance. In yes. the US, absolutely terrifying unless you're an employer. Pay up, pay up front almost. You know? Yep. And yes. anyone who knows me, you know, I've, I've, I was lucky to survive mm. cancer and I got treated in Brisbane with the best medical system I could think of. Um, yes. And I didn't have to pay for any of it, although I made a yeah. huge fundraiser and donated back. So yeah. Medicare is, is a law of obligation, isn't it? It's yes, everyone yes. to look after each other. Yes. Well, that, that is exactly what the state should be. If you have a state, mm. uh, don't have the state as a, um, a support. There's, that's a support base for very rich corporations to be a hand servant, your maid servant for the corporations. Do you know what I mean? It's, it should, first of all, look after people, look after ordinary pop, the, all the ordinary population, you know, really. Um, um, yeah, so, so yeah, uh, that's what I was saying before about uh, human rights. That is human rights, looking after the people, making mm -hmm. sure there are no homeless people, anybody, let alone Aboriginal people because quite often Aboriginal people do have a, a built-in care system, you know, of course, you're all your relatives. The first place you go to is your relatives, you know, but um, a proper system. And that's right, uh, that universal basic income, I'm very interested in that. I've been reading stuff about it for a while. Yeah. Uh, do, do people you understand that, what that is? Yeah. yeah. Well, from what little I understand about it, it sounds good. It sounds like a law of obligation. 
do, do, does anybody know? Because I'm not very good at well, um, we, we had explaining a, it. We had a know? webinar about it recently. I can quickly. All oh, right. Yes. So for those who don't know, a UBI or a universal basic income is the argument that instead of all of these complicated calculations around different kinds of welfare payments, it yeah, actually works out security. to be more cost effective if every single citizen in a place is given um, a livable wage, mm. everyone. Everyone, and then no some what. folks might decide to go and make more money by doing other jobs and other folks would be free to pursue whatever creative or community-based um, mm. interest they have. But yeah, a UBI is about um, ensuring a living wage for everyone. Mm. Um, and then there's other things too, like the job guarantee and they're a different way of doing things, but that's what a UBI mm. is. Yeah, so. and and it's not um, it's not based on um, all the all the hurdles that Social Security puts people through, eh? I get, I get no, it. No, they no, just get it. You know? Everybody gets it. And people can, yeah. and, and I, I can tell you some of the arguments. People say, oh, but no one would work if they got yes. a UBI. It's um, been proved not to be. Yeah. Absolutely wrong. Um, People still love to, but what does happen in the pilot projects they've had, people mm. start pursuing things that don't have a so called economic value in the current economy. They will yeah. care for people. They go and do ecological restoration. They might do a lot mm. of artistic uh, pursuits, but they might also. They just continue their careers because they love them so yes yeah so i I, th I think that's great from what i understand that would come yeah. into this um you know um uh well, it also takes the stigma away. It takes the stigma away of I receive this welfare payment or that welfare payment. Everyone has enough to live, yes. and then people who continue to work and make money still get taxed. So, mm, mm. Mary, can we talk a bit more about the relationship between land and people, and how mm. different Australian society today might look if we had that ethic? And I just want to show. Uh, there's a slide that we, you and I, developed oh, a little while ago. It's not perfect, but oh God, come on, here. Um, oh, yes. When we were looking at, um, I often do a template showing the difference between earth jurisprudence and Western law, um, and earth jurisprudence calls for a respectful living world, mm -hmm. and Aboriginal law, um, particularly with people like um, Irene Watson and, mm -hmm. and you know, talk about it as first law, that the land is the source of the law, and um, it's mm -hmm. really interesting to note that Western law, law has no first law. There is no overarching ethical obligation or moral obligation to care for the environment because of those notions of Western society seeing nature as property, as a commodity. Um, so when you reflect on this, the notion of the relationist ethos in an Australian situation would, I reckon, would turn our society on its head because it yes. would place our relationship with um, the living mm. world primary. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I think I've said it, They've been working with for a while with people in the um, school of philosophy about uh, uh, what if Australia had its own philosophy, a real philosophy, you know, and and as you might, well, everybody knows, you know, a real philosophy. Take, it might take centuries to develop, and then of course it it engenders other people to come up with some other idea about what the philosophy could be, you know, and so on. Um, but because things are getting more urgent literally uh, uh what do they call it perfect storms it's a gathering of perfect storms you know climate change uh the global economy wars um pandemics you know you name other things too you know um um the the fearful thing about a ai what are, what are they on about you know what's what's sneaking up on us um but um why why couldn't an australia for me is in the perfect place uh, not just because they're here and Aboriginal people are here, but because we're situated right between Asia and the rest of the world. Everybody wants to say it's isolated, isn't it? It's not bloody isolated. We're in a in a place surrounded by millions of people, <laughs> millions and millions. We're the centre of, of the universe, Mary. Yes, we this that. this is it's, the only, it's only Europeans this. and North Americans who think we're isolated. No, I'm kind yes, of yes. That's that's right. We are, but it's a good thing. Yeah. When I when I first uh, went to university in the politics department, I saw in the in, in the kitchen a great big map, war map, and the the center of the map was America. Mm, always so, is. 
Yeah, yeah. And I thought, what's that doing there? That's <laughs> the first thing I said. <laughs> it should be Australia in the middle there. That's that's what you should be looking at at this country. And then look at all the neighbours. You know, Even in basic stuff. graphic design stuff, Mary, when we're looking yeah. for material to promote discussions about earth centered governance, we've got to work really hard to find a picture of the world or a satellite image of the world with Australia on it. Every uh, yes. American. Yes, it's stuck that's way the down there. You know? Globalization. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. the but the idea of a philosophy, um, uh, and it's not just suddenly coming up with one idea for a philosophy. Um, it, it, it is about um, uh, bringing bringing to the forefront different kinds of arguments or philosophizing about how important the land is to our well-being. Now, not just well-being in the usual ways, but well-being as in who are we as Homo sapiens? Mm -hmm. Who who are we? And where have we come from and where are we going? Um, because uh, uh, another thing, working with um, a uh, friend, uh, Morgan, Morgan <laughs> uh, the idea of um, uh, if you want to pinpoint, say, um, agriculture as a big change, huge change for all human groups from then on, you know, uh, and now we, because of all these perfect storms that are surrounding us, <laughs> coming up under us, um, maybe we should try and sort out in conjunction with having a, a, an Australian philosophy. Well, what's it going to be like for the next 10,000 years? Have a, have a look at that. The first 10,000 years, this is where we've got to. And the next 10,000 years, where, where, where do you hope to be? So not, not um, looking only at like dystopian ideas, utopian ideas. Um, don't don't either uh, be completely drowned in technology, science and technology, because I think that would be a danger. That yes. could be dangerous. You can't ignore it, but you, you have to be extremely careful so it doesn't take over. So the, the whole idea, uh, the underpinning thing of an Australian philosophy could be starting off with land and seeing land it's it's more than the thing that keeps us alive it's actually a player or an actor in its own right and we have to train train ourselves to be uh empathetic uh to learn to have a conscience and we learn it via land so we look after land because land is always in it it's owed it's owed big time <laughs> so don't don't madly exploit it and be cruel to it and all that kind of stuff so look after it and then there's a payoff there's a pay it's like a payback but it's all natural a mm. payback and what that does is uh it strengthens the um the um oh, i just said the word um it strengthens the oh god the okay. thing inside you oh i just said the word before i know normally i can help you out with an extra yes. word but i am wordless. Yes. God, um, uh, it's like a principled living or ethics. Yes. Um, oh God, isn't it all? Yeah, I mean philosophy. I've got a, no, no. Um, I, I've gotten to the point. This is growing older and forget, make, becoming more and more forgetful. Um, Mary, I think you could forget a lot and still know more than most. No, no. <laughs> no. Um, Would ethos do the job? It's like ethos, actually. No, it is like that. Um, code, guiding force, guiding force, compass, compass, uh, autonomy, uh, custodianship, coherence. Uh, eh? Sorry. Obligation. Obligation. Yeah. No, it's all in that one word. Um, you end up with uh, if you don't have this. If you don't have this, then you are path pathological. It's what a serial killer is. Oh, he doesn't have conscience. Have em conscience, empathy. Conscience. Yes, yes. That's land. When you look after land, it starts out your building and building, uh, building up, making stronger a conscience. Because if you don't learn to look after something outside of the self, it's got to be outside the self. And everybody has always thought and uh, 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 and it has worked in some ways but not for not for a long time it doesn't work because even religious people as you know you know there's been wars uh all sorts you know um, protestant catholic you know big wars like that so religion isn't a saving thing either <laughs> it's a comforting thing for individuals you believe in something and you're comfortable you know but looking after something outside of the self outside of yourself but you can put it like good samaritanism 
<laughs> Good Samaritanism. You're learning it and that becomes internalized, embedded in you. So you, you, it doesn't make you good because you can forget that too, but it, at least it's embedded in you and that helps. You have, an, if, you have that because if you don't have this, um, oh God, what did I just say? See, this is how this conscience. Works. conscience. <laughs> if you don't have this built in, then you can become, uh, well, the worst ending for it is fascism. That becomes normalized. Yeah. Um, or, or the, the singular yeah. individual one is a serial killer. They don't have a conscience. They just, you know, they see a person. It's just an object, really. They have no feelings whatsoever about it. There have been a lot of uh, writers who liken corporations to psychopaths. Yes. Because yes. it doesn't need to have feelings or empathy. I often yes. say corporations are like vampires. Yes. They have eternal yes. life and they suck the life out of many of the resources and things around yeah. them. Yes. Hey Mary, as we start to wrap up, what I might do, I'm just going to share a couple yes. of slides Finished. just to put us into the space of uh, some of the work that we're doing inside Ayla, Nina, Green Prince. But then we might come back. And Mary, could we end today on yeah, that yeah. beautiful story you tell about the creation of how the people were made by the beings? Can we finish with that story? Oh, yeah, that's a lovely that story. story. Yeah. yeah, it is. Um, so just quickly, I'll, I'll yeah. just finish with a okay. few slides, then I'll hand over to you, Mary. So yes, okay. what I wanted to invite people to think about, um, and certainly as we start getting out the draft of our book together, there's a lot of friends and colleagues we're going to be sharing it with to get your input, uh, little boxed th thoughts of things. Um, but if we think about what Australian society could look like if it was built on the relationist ethos, and I've moved it around the proper way, um, caring for country and the first laws, the law of the land, all of these ideas would start mm. to become infused. And I think we see it growing and growing through the ecological work people do. Um, but I love the idea of a future society that is um, honoring and privileging indigenous knowledge and governance systems, but then also making sure that non-indigenous people uh, embed this into their own ways of thinking and doing so that we all mm. care for the joint. And I mm. love, if anyone wants, do look up work by Mary Graham, of course, and Anne Polina and mm. Irene Watson um, books about uh, first laws, this idea that mm. it's all place-based. And this brings us back to all our topic today, yep. localization. Mm. Uh, I believe that um, cultures like the Australian Aboriginal cultures, the, all the different groups and other Indigenous folks um, and early, early, early ancestors down my pathway understood localization because that was their world their world mm. was based on that reality of servicing their needs by looking after the joint and caring for the place mm. but in australia now we we are a country that has the capacity to rethink and hopefully maybe rebuild some of the ways we work yeah. yes so yes the vision that we have inside ayla and the new economy and certainly in our green prince program is a vision of very healthy country and healthy communities uh, where Indigenous mm. boundaries and places can be privileged and respected mm. and where Indigenous people want to bring some of us in, these could become newer boundaries for modern society too. Mm. But also Western science, it acknowledges mm. that there are 89 bioregions in Australia and 415 sub-regions. So this is Western science's way of telling us that country is made up of lots of remarkable pockets and patchwork quilt style mm forms of life and geology and plants mm. and soils there is no one size fits all aboriginal no. societies worked it out our standardization the rolling out of the kind of separation of human from nature the mm. domination of human from nature is talked about a lot but it's when you see this map that you realize mm. those political boundaries are not much chop um mm. and we really need to be thinking about the world differently mm. this is just a fun cartoon style version of catchments which is where water goes Many aspects in Australia's modern natural resource management systems look at catchments. There's a lot of work done by Western science and caring humans um, looking in this modern framework about what country is all about. And what we need to do is bring together the, the, the excellent way that, that Australians look after each other most of the time when the excellent things that First Nation peoples and Western science have to say and actually eliminate the middle mess, which is our legal and planning system, which doesn't respect um, life and perpetuating life. So 
Hmm. That's my plug for Green Prince, which is a program that I've been developing inside Ayla, Nina, with many, many amazing colleagues. And I drag Mary and other Indigenous mates in um, to get their advice and wisdom. But it's really about, and I won't go through that, it's about helping non-Indigenous people rethink the systems we have, shifting worldview, thinking about economics, law, politics, and bringing it down to the human scale and caring for country. And that, hmm. I believe, is the end of my um, Western style, style slides. But what I wanted to say is through our interest in localization, the new Economy Network Australia is really committed to place-based localizing of our society's economies and governance. How do we work and play together? How do we divvy up the pizza? Um, so yeah, but Mary, did you want to tell your story? And if anyone else has to leave, you can, but I love hearing that story if that's all right. Um, well. I was just thinking, though, no, has people asked questions? There were questions coming in on the chat, oh. but I think everyone was listening. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> um, 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 look, a, a really important part of this governance, I was going to say, is mm -hmm. um, um, uh, uh, sovereignty. And now I don't like the word sovereignty myself because it talks about sovereign, you know, sovereigns, and I don't know if people are familiar with the the Treaty of Westphalia. These are the Europeans who've been who'd been fighting for centuries and centuries amongst each other, trying to work out who's going to be the hegemonic ruler. <laughs> and then they decided, God, this is going even for, far, far too much even for us. So they got together West Treaty of Westphalia, um, had agreed with various principles and so on and so on. And one of them was to do with uh, sovereignty. Uh, it worked for a little while, then they went back to their bad old habits, having wars over, you know, who's going to be top dog. Um, and then and it carries on right through World War One, World War Two, you know, and so on and so on, and possibly maybe another one in the in the uh, uh, waiting to enter stage right, you know. Um, but um, having, it would be wonderful if, if part of that Australian, uh, Australian philosophy, different way of running the country, uh, really fully understanding where they are in the world and who they are, deciding, uh, making a, a, um, a, an existential uh, fundamental decision about who they are and who they want to be. Uh, don't be, don't be, um, I hate to say it, but uh, a poodle like other people, other countries who want to follow the big hegemonic ruler um, because you'll never be free. You know, I say this, I, I say this as part of this working out this uh, philosophy. It has to stand up for itself and own itself. That's the one thing that Aboriginal people did do. This is via all the different countries. They're, they're autonomous, see? They're on, you know. They wouldn't allow anybody else to tell them. And they're still like that, actually. They get very argumentative if they think that some other group from somewhere else tries to tell them how to do things. <laughs> Big row start, starts up straight away. So it'd be wonderful if Australia could could do that, you know. But uh, that story is um, how in from the west, uh, from the um, out west, uh, and it's a public story, so it's not secret, sacred, uh, uh, anything. Anyway, they're, um, they're, um, it starts out like the, the world is flat, flat, <laughs> it's actually flat, well, that is like a moonscape, a lunarscape, no features, nothing, but there's uh, dormant life, you know, asleep under the earth, way down. It's never quite clear, it's something stirs them awake and they start emerging, different beings emerging above the surface, and what they are are uh, basically um, flora and fauna and other kind of creatures, you know, but they're huge. So a kangaroo as big as a two-story building or a snake as big as a train. And in their movements around, they actually shape the land. They actually shape it. That's how the, the, most of the stories Aboriginal people talk about, um, uh, these ancestral beings as they're moving about. But they're not just moving about, they're fighting with each other too. They have very human-like <laughs> features. <laughs> so they might be, well, this one might be jealous of that one. Uh, others uh, might, might be, <laughs> um, um, you know, um, uh, chasing one another out, killing one another, actually, very, very human-like. And but all this ruckus noise is uh, wakes up this other dormant life, and what they are are, are proto-humans. They're still in the fetal stage, proto-humans. So they 
and of course they can't walk. So they awakened, you know, under the earth and they crawl to the surface. And these other by now ancestral beings, you know, all the flora and fauna, they step in and help these proto-humans become fully formed human beings. It's, it's like a bit like an assembly line, really. They, um, they get together, they help them stand up straight. And there's a real description about how they do all this. So they help these little fetuses stand up straight, um, straighten out their limbs, slap them on the back, clear their nose and mouth, help them to breathe, um, teach them things and so on. So they're fully formed human beings then. So created by, and you, you can tell this is a genesis, isn't it? You know, it's a, a creative drama uh, of how people come into the world. Now that's just in one place. Just imagine there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of stories that are similar to that in all these different places. They might be, it, they might be uh, along the lines of a particular flora or fauna help to the humans to become into being, you know, or they are changed into human beings and so Anyway, uh, they get to the end of that. Uh, these ancestral beings then turn around and teach these brand new humans what all this is about, what the hell is going on, you know. This is why you're here. This is who you are. This is what you have to do. You know, this is basically the rules of life, you know. Uh, you've got to look after the place and so on and so on and so on. So all those sort of rules. And then they uh, return back to where they emerged from. And um, uh, so they're ready for life itself. All the landscape has been created and they have to fill that landscape and carry out these rules, <laughs> basically, of looking after the land and so on. And so so it all finishes there, you know, um, so and it goes on like that. Human beings have been created by our plant and animal ancestors. Mm, literally They're older than us. Um, and yes, and, and just think for a minute. It actually crosses over to what science actually says. Yes. In a sense, science the Aboriginal people via those stories, they're saying that science is actually right. The land is, we don't come from outer space. Although there are dreaming stories by some people, one particular old fellow, he talked about, uh, uh, and other cultures have this too, um, sky spirits and law, land spirits, mm -hmm. and they meet. Do you know what I mean? That That's the nearest thing to uh, any kind of religion that I've ever come across. Uh, but but anyway, they um, they have to carry out this and it it never ends. You have to do this all the time, no matter what, you know. Um, Thank you, Mary. And the reason I, as a non-Indigenous person, love that story is it, it kind of makes me feel that everything I've been taught through Western science and Western mm. ways of thinking about the emergence and evolution um, mm. connects to this beautiful story that, yes, we're mm. just, we're just young'uns and we've been brought into this place um, and the plants and the animals are our elders and our olders and our, you know, ancestors and let's, let's get our act together and look after the place. But mm. I, I just think it's a beautiful way of looking at the yeah. world. Yeah. And Mary, look, I've kept you okay. eight minutes over time <laughs> and I've kept others too. Yeah. No, it's not you, it's yeah. me. Yeah. I just want to say thank yeah. you, um, Mary. Mm. It's, it's obviously you. a great privilege to work with I, you. I just, I just want to yeah. say hello to Gil. I'm sorry, Gil. <laughs> yes, it's lovely to see you again. I'm sorry. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. No, and look, we we did open up for questions, but uh, very few questions came through. So I think everyone was just yeah. enjoying listening. But I did want to say um, a huge thank you for your time, Mary. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, stay in touch through uh, Future Dreaming. Futuredreaming.org.au is where Mary, myself, Ross Williams and others come together and share. Mm. Um, and do look up Mary's work. We've got on the mm. Future Dreaming website. A list yeah, of a lot of papers there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And videos, lots of Mary's talks. Oh, now. videos, yeah. We, mm. we drag you out all the time, Mary. You're on YouTube yeah. a lot now. <laughs> yes. But thanks, okay. everyone. Thank you. And, um, yeah, Thank you do much. embrace that relationist ethos and think about how you can change. Uh, yeah, and think, and think about um, add, uh, do papers, if you like, you know, whatever, uh, about uh, what, what some things that an Australian philosophy uh, could um, uh, in, engage with or include in there, yes. you know, anything at all. Send them to us, whatever you write. Yes. Yeah, that's, that'd be great. <laughs> see you then. The first to know when the book comes out. Thank yes. you again so much, Mary. Lovely see to see you. See you then. Bye. Bye.